As Glennon said, my name is Mark Mensher. I'm a game programmer, author of the book Get in the Game, and CEO of Game Recruiter. I've been uh, working in the video game industry for 27 years now. Every time I say that, it makes me sound like a relic. Um, any event um, for 27 years. Uh, I've worked with companies like um, Spectrum Holobyte, Microprose, and the 3DO company. And over uh, the career, I was uh, able to release 10 games to market. Two of the games I'm quite proud of because they were the first in their genre. Uh, I released the first racing game, Vet, to the North American market. And I was also involved with Falcon, the first uh, flight simulator to the North American market. So uh, those are some of the, uh, some of the games I've put to, to market. But as I uh, started to um, work at companies, I got promoted very quickly. And um, of course, um, had to manage teams, run development projects, and learn to hire. You know, I got started in the industry in a very interesting way. I first uh, graduated from college, and I went to work for a robotics company, Cincinnati Millicron. They made robots for um, the automobile industry. You see those robots making, uh, making the cars. And I was working on an artificial intelligence project, uh, trying to advance the uh, smartness, of course, of those, uh, those robots. And I uh, spent a lot of time at Carnegie Mellon University at their Robotics Institute. And at nighttime, when all the professors went home and uh, we were uh, in charge of, uh, of the school, we took control of the mainframe. I'm sure the administration at the school wouldn't have been too happy to know about that. And we started playing the first game I ever saw, which was known today as Asteroids. Uh, the minute I saw that game, I realized I was in the wrong industry, working for the wrong company. I quit my job, packed my bags, moved to San Francisco, walked into the doors of a company called Sphere, which changed its name to Spectrum Holobyte, and volunteered my body and was hired immediately. Of course, back then, 27 years ago, working in the video game industry uh, was not common. We were considered freaks and geeks. We were considered people who were untrainable and unhirable in other industries. And here I am with someone uh, with a degree and with someone who had prior research in AI. So of course, I was greeted with open arms. Today, it's a much different experience. Obviously, games are quite mainstream. Uh, we now need degrees uh, to get into the industry. And it's not so easy to break in as it was for me. So, uh, so that's why I'm here today to talk to you. So I've got two goals in mind. Uh, my goal today is to expose you to some of the careers in the industry and also to begin the process of being your coach uh, by preparing you for one of the toughest life experiences you're going to experience after you get your degree, which is the first job hunt. The first job hunt is very difficult. There are no ways to skirt around it. You can't hire someone to do it. You can't use an online job board to do it. It's something that you must do yourself and focus on it and learn how to do it. So I'm hoping to uh, help you along with that process today. Um, also, do realize I've only got about an hour for this presentation. So I'm going to do my best to present to you a lot of information. I do tend to talk very quickly with my New York style. So I hope that doesn't turn some of you off. Please just sit back, relax, try to absorb the information I'm go going to give you today. And of course, this is being recorded. So all the information uh, will be available to you. Great. So let's get going. So uh, the first thing to do is I really recommend you all get the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? This book will teach you how to establish, form, and run your own job search. We're not taught this in school. Most of your schooling at Westwood, which is an awesome program, by the way, is teaching you the fundamentals to be an artist, a game designer, you know, a programmer. But we're not actually teaching you how to do your job hunt. And something like uh, What Color Is Your Parachute? is an excellent resource to help you organize, put together the process, and then, of course, run that process. They also have a website in conjunction with it, uh, jobhuntersbible.com. But I do recommend you read the book first before you get onto that website, because it does uh, they do go hand in hand. So let's take a little bit, look at the industry on the whole. We're experiencing a 10.3% growth rate per year, which is fantastic. And by the year 2015, it's expected that our industry will generate in excess of $70 billion. So for you, yeah, really, right. So for you, that is great news. Let's look at some of the segments uh, you know, uh, broken down. The casual social mobile space is expected to grow to $18 billion by the year 2014. 
The MMO and virtual worlds uh, section is uh, expected to grow by 12 billion. We also see that internet connected game consoles will be increased to 8.7 billion. And uh, global revenue for augmented reality is projected at 1.5. So we're looking at a total worldwide uh, growth rate uh, uh, by 2016 of $81 billion in revenue. So again, awesome, awesome news. So what this means for us and you is that our industry is poised for massive growth. It has been growing at a massive rate. There are plenty of jobs available and anyone can make a career for themselves in the industry if you're focused and dedicated to do so. Okay, let's take a look at the industry real quick. You know, you can't lump the game industry into one segment. You need to look at us at, uh, broken up into the segments that we are. Currently, it's PC, console, MMO, handheld mobile, serious games, medical simulation, and military simulation. So when you're job hunting, you need to realize, you need to sort of decide which segment of the market you're interested in and focus yourself toward that because, of course, some of the uh, segments require different skills and uh, experience bases. Careers are artists, programmer, game designer, producer, QA, marketing and sales, biz dev, customer support, audio, IT, HR, web, portal development, and that's just a few of them. Great. In the, uh, in the artist realm, we can break that down from concept art, character modeling, environmental art, animator, cinematic artist, technical artist, special effects artist. We can go on and on. Riggers, skinners, you know, on and on and on with specialties, but those are the major, major ones. And of course, the major skills for us to know for these markets are Photoshop, Illustrator, ZBrush, 3D Studio Max, Maya, XSI, and really important is to learn the scripting languages within those 3D <laughs> software programs such as MEL, MacScript, and the new Python scripting language, which will be incorporated in the new versions of Max and Maya coming out in the next year or so. So uh, Flash has also become uh, very important uh, as the casual social mobile space takes off. In the programming realm, we see engineering, tools engineers, gameplay programmers, graphics, network, AI, J2ME Brew. Not surprising, of course. Uh, the general required experiences for programmers are C, C++, Java, and assembly. Yes, we are still using assembly. Of course, in my day 27 years ago, we were making games for DOS and Windows 1.0. Uh, back then, Windows 1.0 was a nightmare. Uh, and uh, thank God, uh, Microsoft has given us development tools for the game industry in the, more, in the current versions. Uh, but it really is still important to know assembly because no matter what user interface is being used, most of the time we have to break around it uh, so that we can make our games rock on the screen. So, um, so of course, networking has become uh, a big focus in our industry. MySQL, Ruby on Rails, Unix, Linux, Flash, Objective-C, tools and application, physics, math, 3D, AI, graphics, sound. So other kind of jobs are QA jobs. We've got the QA testers, the leads, the managers, directors. Those are awesome careers to get into. In fact, QA is one of the ways to get into a game company if you're struggling getting in uh, with your uh, first intention, of course, as an artist or a program or, or something else. For QA, uh, you need to have deep gameplay knowledge. You also have the, the ability to spot bugs and glitches and logic errors. Um, of course, extensive console and PC experience is always required, and learning Microsoft Project and Office. Now, when I talk about uh, games, you really need to be able to play games, old games, new games, especially the old games, especially the old games on the old platforms, like SNES, like the Atari 2600, if you still can find one. Because, you know, every few years we, fought, we have new platforms that come out. Let's look at the iPhone, for instance. When it first came out, just like the Super Nintendo, it had a limited memory footprint, still does have a limited memory footprint. So, uh, you know, having the ability to make a game with very limited memory or make art that rocks with very limited memory is still a skill that we need today, even though some of the consoles and some of the platforms can handle much more. So uh, knowing old games and new games is very important. 
It's also important to get to understand the history of our industry because, of course, when you go to interview for a job, if you don't know who the 3DO company was, if you don't know who Chip Hawkins is, if you don't know who John Romero is, if you don't know who Tom Hall is, how are you going to engage yourself in a conversation with someone who's already in the industry? So you definitely want to be able to familiarize yourself not only with the technologies that you need to get a job, but also with the history of the, the industry and why some of these games were important and what they caused and created. Okay, breaking in. You need to decide on a career discipline. After that discipline has been decided, you need to get yourself trained. And lucky for you, you're at Westwood College where you're getting excellent education and support. But you can't rely uh, on the education and support uh, alone. You need to build on the foundation that Westwood College is going to give you and do something with it once you're done with it. It's not your birthright to graduate and then all of a sudden get a job. There's still a lot of work ahead uh, when you, uh, once you graduate. Uh, of course, we have to create a demo. Everyone in our industry needs a demo. I don't care if you're in business development, in human resources, in marketing, in programming, in arts. You must have a demo to get a job in our industry. So uh, very important to get that demo done. Of course, uh, my recommendation is you uh, narrowly focus your job search. I'll be teaching you that in the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? You want to create your top 10, top 12 list of companies that you want to work for and focus in on those companies. And as you're going to see uh, during this presentation, I'm going to be encouraging you to uh, not exactly be approaching human resources or answering job ads. I'm going to be actually encouraging you to job hunt, which is picking up the telephone, which is sending emails and talking to people and interacting and engaging. That's what a job hunt is, not sending out paper and not talking to the HR department or answering job ads. And so that's why networking is key, and you're going to hear me say networking over and over again at this presentation. You must build a network of people for you to network with so you can, you can access the unadvertised job market. Only 10% of the jobs that are available are ever advertised. So why go for the, that, that small fish when you could be swimming in a much larger pool? So uh, we're going to be talking about accessing the unadvertised job market today. According to the Department of Labor, and I've kind of said this already, more than 90% of jobs are obtained through networking because only 10% of the jobs are ever advertised. So of course, you want access to those 90% of the jobs, don't you? Not the job that anyone can apply for or that are easily, are easily uh, findable. So job hunting, it's a numbers game. I sort of think of job hunting as Pac-Man. So no, 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 no. And then you're going to get a few yeses. But don't freak out. No means you're getting something. You're getting feedback. You're getting reaction. And you're going to get no. And it's not personal. It's not about you. It's just that there's a thousand other applicants who also want into our industry. And some of those people are going to be way more qualified or slightly more aggressive than you have been. And that's OK. And just because you got a no today does not mean that the same company will not give you a yes tomorrow. So again, job hunting is about not taking things personally a lot of people fail at their dream job. They train themselves, and then they fail at actually accomplishing their goal because they give up during that first job hunt, which is extremely difficult. It's extremely emotional. So I'm really going to encourage you guys today to get out of the emotion. Don't even go there. Someone's going to say no. Big deal. They said no. That's a mistake. You know, if you're a salesperson, you know not to take no, I don't take no, until I hear it three or four times from the same person. I just figure the first few times they say no, they're confused. So I just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And that's what you got to do as well. So also, uh, online job hunting services. Of course, they're a tool, but they're not a tool to be relied upon. I'm not a fan of those online job hunting services. And I really encourage you not to post your full resume on an online service. Uh, what you want to do is you want to keep control of your job search. You do not want to give your control up to some job board. You don't want to give your control away of your job search to a human resources department. You need to be driving the ship. So uh, really the best thing to do with an uh, online job a board of any sort is to put a summary and a teaser about your skills. What benefits do you bring? Your contact information. Make sure someone has to come to you to get your detailed resume and to get to your demo, 
so that you're in control, you can track that information and, and, and know what's going on. Let's talk about the HR departments and how they really work. Go back a slide, I guess. So uh, HR departments are set up for two things, benefits administration and to help the current employees. And, and the other thing is to stop you, the job hunter, from annoying and talking to the hiring manager. I know that sounds weird, but that is exactly their job. And what I'm talking to you today is really about going around the HR system. Sure, we're going to be friendly to HR. We need them. They're very valuable. But you should be handing human resources your resume as you walk in the door for the interview that you already set up yourself because you were assertive enough to be talking to the hiring managers and approaching the company directly. So that's really what HR is all about. So, uh, and think about it. You know, an art director is an art director. That's their real function. A, a vice, vice president of engineering is a vice president of engineering. That's his or her real function. To hire is not exactly what they want to do. It's not their favorite thing to do. And here comes human resources. They placed uh, the same job ad for that environmental artist on six websites. 3,000 people have responded to the job ad. They've, circ they've sorted through the job ad. They've come down to a list of 1,000 folks. They walk into the VP of engineering's uh, office, and they plop down 1,000 resumes on his or her desk. And what do you think their reaction is? Oh, my. Like, they even want to deal with that pile, let alone have to do the hiring in the first place? No way. So the person who's a squeaky wheel, the person who's been emailing, who's been calling, that's the person who they're going to be paying attention to rather than that pile of 1,000 resumes on the desk. Because you're the one who's been calling, who's been emailing, who's been approaching, who's been networking. You're the one who's obviously quite interested in getting in the industry and wasn't lazy about the process of just answering a job ad. So again, it's about using your network and building a network. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit. Networking musts. Upcoming events is the uh, Virtual Game Industry Career Expo. You'll be able to, just like on an MMO, you'll be able to develop an avatar and attend this conference from any computer anywhere in the world with an internet connection. And you'll get to interface with Activision, Ubisoft, all of the companies that are hiring. I recommend that each and every one of you uh, get yourselves registered for the Virtual Game uh, Career Expo. Also, you want to join the International Game Developers Association and any other type of group that is involved in games. Even if your IGDA chapter locally is not very active, even if it only has three people in it, it doesn't matter. Get involved, volunteer, get it on your resume. And what's most important about IGDA is when you go to the conferences, uh, like the Game Developer Conference, IGDA has its separate tracks, IGDA has its separate events. So, uh, and you want at that net, in that networking party at IGDA at Game Developers, and you're not getting in unless you're a member of the group. And why do you want in there? Because that's where John Romero is going to be. That's where Chip Hawkins is going to be. That's where the people who have made this industry are going to be and the folks that you want to network with. That's where that senior game designer is going to be because we all are members of our association and so should you. So uh, obviously attending the Game Developer Conference which is coming up in San Francisco this March 5th through 9th is something I highly recommend. I realize that it's expensive, the, uh, the Game Developer Conference. One way to attend it is to volunteer. So volunteer yourself to work at the conference. They'll allow you access to the conference for free. Volunteer at IGDA. The IGDA has their own tracks at the conference. They'll get you into the conference for free. So get creative if you can't afford the price for the ticket. Worst comes to worst, you're not on the show floor, but you hang out at one of the host hotels. You hang out in the lobby at the hotel. If you can't, if you can't volunteer and you can't pay for that ticket, then get to the, one of those hotels and hang out. And I'm not talking about drinking here. No drinking, you know, you need to be socializing and networking, you're job hunting, you're not getting drunk. So um, very important to use the Game Developer Conference any way you can uh, to, to, do, to uh, get exposure. So let's look at some networking tips. You're ahead of me a little bit. Um, use social networking sites like Facebook, LinkedIn, and of course, data.com, which used to be called Jigsaw. Those are very important. While we're talking about networking sites for, for a minute, 
Um, I really don't understand for some people what they don't get about World Wide Web. That's what it is. When you post something on the internet, it is there for eternity, and you cannot retract it. If you do not want your parents, your mother and father to read about it, don't post it. Seriously, got to get real serious about this. Lock down your Facebook account. If you have, lock it so that only your real friends get to see what's going on. And then, of course, anybody else just gets to see the general stuff that's on the surface. So make sure you are learning Facebook or any of these networking sites and make sure you have the control or don't post at all. I had a candidate, they make hire and fire decisions based on your social plot, your social stuff. Not only do they do reference checks, but they are going on the internet and they are checking you out. If you've got pictures of, al of you with alcohol, with you with an with a illegal substance in your hand, you are not getting a job in our industry. I had a woman who was very qualified. She uh, went through interviews. We actually had pre-discussed what her salary was going to be. And guess what? HR got onto her Facebook page. And really, the pictures on the page were quite innocent. They were really a goodbye party from the last game company she worked at. But, according, but from what the HR person saw, all the HR person saw was several pictures of her with several different guys. So the assumption made by HR was this person is promiscuous. We're not going to hire. Job gone. So that's what I'm talking about, being really careful about your social networking sites, what you post, what you say, and what you do, because it's there for eternity, and we will find it, and we will check it. Okay, it's also important when you're job hunting and when you're meeting and socializing people to develop a one-minute pitch. You know, you're going to write this pitch. It's going to be authentic. It's something that you created, so it will never sound canned. You heard my one-minute pitch today. It didn't sound canned to you, did it? Hi, my name is Mark Mencher. been in the game industry 27 years. Work for game companies like Spectrum, Holobyte, Microprose, 3DO. That's my pitch. And my pitch is designed to, create, to establish credibility. Your pitch, of course, will be designed to establish, hey, I'm an artist. Hey, I'm a game programmer. Hey, I'm a game designer. That's what your pitch is all about. So develop a one-minute pitch. Focus on meeting the people in your top 10 target company list. So when you're at conferences, anywhere you are, you want to meet the folks that work at the companies because they will help you get access to the unadvertised jobs, that is, which is the market that you want to be hunting in. Talk to people in your targeted field of expertise. Uh, talking to people is quite important. One way to do it is to get onto the internet, get onto these magazines. Who's writing articles? I wouldn't, I wouldn't contact someone who wrote an article this month. Uh, what I would do is find someone who wrote an article three or four months ago. If someone published an article just a few days ago, they're being bombarded by emails from lots of people for lots of reasons. You don't want to be caught in that. What you want to do is find someone who three, four, five months ago wrote articles. Contact that person. Contact that artist, that game designer, that programmer. Hey, I loved your article on XYZ. I really learned a lot about it. By the way, I'm a student at Westwood College, and I want to be an, a game programmer. I want to be a game artist when I grow up. Do you mind being a mentor and sometimes commenting or giving me advice? People love to help people. Sure, you might get one or two emails saying, no, no thank you, whatever. You know what? I still keep their name, their address, and their phone number in my database because it doesn't matter. Six months from now or a year from now, that person might be receptive. You don't know what's happening on the other end. They're, they just could have had a death in the family. They, could have been, they just could have been chewed out by their boss at work. So they were just kind of grumpy when they saw your emails. It's not personal. Job hunting is not personal. So just note that, and there you go. But you know, you will get a lot of people saying, sure, I don't mind mentoring you. I don't mind giving you some advice. And that's exactly what you want, because you're going to want to start to build a database. So I'm recommending from the moment you walk out of this room is to go find a database, FileMaker Pro, Act, whatever works for you. Learn that database. Everyone in your Westwood College programs, every one of you, put everyone's name in that. You want to be able to find everyone 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Believe me, some of you people are going to get jobs and become hiring managers, and you're going to remember, hey, what about Tom? We were at Westwood College together. I wonder what happened to Tom. You should be able to be, you should be staying in contact with folks. You should be findable very easily so that, the, so that you are you know, able to find the jobs and get get approached by jobs. Uh, so that's about that. So networking tips. 
So, okay, you're not in the industry yet. I've sent you to a conference. You're going to a conference. You know, there's a big uh, advantage to being what you say you are. So just because you're not an artist yet or a programmer, say it anyway, be it anyway, do it anyway. So I recommend that when you're at a conference, create a, a business card. And as you can see, this is like a clever little business card slash summary of a resume. So right here, it's my technical skills. Bam, 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 benefit, 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 benefit. My name, what I want to be, game programmer, and how to get a hold of me. So this is exactly what I recommend you do in all networking situations. Uh, so uh, very important for you to do. By the way, when your database, besides everyone from Westwood College, you also want to put your entire family into the database. Yes, your aunts, your uncles, even your grandmother can help you get a job. And can, so you want them in the database and you want to be able to use them. My grandmother, in her, she's in her, in her late 90s, not, does, knows nothing about video games, barely knows what I do. But you know, I've taken the time to sit her down, show her my resume, explain to her what it is I do. And she was playing Marjan a few, a few years ago with one of her girlfriends. And guess what? Her grandson was a programmer in the video game industry. So through my grandmother's connection, I was able to meet this programmer and place this programmer in her job. The same thing will happen to you. Use your family. They've got networks as well. They'll be able to introduce you to game people. You'll be quite amazed. And that, again, will be folks that will help you ac access the unadvertised job market. So everyone and anyone you know, start to get them into your database and code them. Family, hiring managers, employers, whatever your coding system is, you'll learn how to do that and manage that database. I have maintained a database for over 25 years. That database has made me millions of dollars. It has brought me countless numbers of opportunities, and I promise you it'll do the same for you as well. So it's worth your time and effort. Okay, let's get onto some common mistakes that people make. One generic resume blasted out to the universe is like playing the lottery. It is absolutely ineffective and does nothing for you. You must customize your approach to every game company you approach, just like you must customize your demo. I realize for some of us who are artists, that's a little bit more difficult than for some of the other careers. But I'm sorry, you got to suck it up. You must customize. Electronic Arts, their sports division, doesn't care about your science fiction art. Don't want to see it. Won't extrapolate from it. Oh, he can do a spaceship. That means he can do a sports arena. Not happening. You need to show EA Sports sports images. You need to show a sci-fi company sci-fi images. So that's what I'm talking about, customization. Very important to do. Um, another mistake people make is they write a resume that's full of function. We all know what an animator does. We all know what a programmer does. Don't tell me again in the resume that you are, you know, these kinds of things. What we're looking for in your resume is what you can do. What are your accomplishments? That is what the resume is uh, communicating. So uh, that's a mistake I see often, is that folks do not focus on their accomplishments. They actually just describe function. So uh, another problem we see is that people give up control of their job search to the HR department of a game company. Why would you give up control of your job search to anyone? It's your search. You keep in control of it. You run it. You drive it. So very important. Another thing is only responding to job ads. That's also giving up control. That's giving up the control to who's ever on the other end of the job ad. Why would you do that? You want to be in control of driving the ship. Relying on recruiting firms to do your job hunt for you. That is another mistake. Recruiting firms can be aug an augmentation of something that is an additional help to you, but they certainly should not be the only thing you use in a job hunt. And by the way, none of you here is qualified to be represented by a recruiter uh, or a career coach like myself until you have at least two, if not three, games professionally produced and sold in the market. Otherwise, do not go to a recruiter because there's a $15,000, $25,000 fee on your head if that company tries to hire you. And if you think Ubisoft, Electronic Arts, Activision, or any of these companies is going to pay fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for someone who's just graduated from school without proven entity, you're crazy. So do not use a recruiter until you've got at least two, if not three, professional games on the market, and then someone like me will rock your world. But before that, I'm sorry, 
There's just no easy way around that job hunt. You've got to do it yourself. Another mistake I see in resumes is assuming that the reader of the resume knows anything about the industry or the history of our industry. Do not make that assumption. You need to write your resume to two audiences, the person who does not understand the industry and then, of course, the person who does, because you want your resume routed out correctly. And sometimes the folks in the human resources department are really human resources experts, not game experts. I know they work in a game company, but that doesn't mean they play games. And it certainly doesn't mean that they know that the 3DO company was Trip Hawkins' second company, that the 3DO company made a, its own console, that the 3DO company went out of business. They don't know that. All they see is that you don't work there anymore. And if you were unfortunate enough to be at the 3DO company for the last six months, and then the company closed, and then you had to get another job, you don't want the resume reader to assume you're a job hopper. You want them to know that, of course, the company closed. That's why you went to, to look for another job. So again, you need to write your resume for the two audiences, which are, of course, someone who does not know the industry and someone who does. Uh, the, and the final thing is, of course, failing to prepare your references ahead of time. It's really important uh, to get your references uh, prepared. So what does that mean? You want four references, not, even though three are only required. The reason why you want four is because in case someone's on vacation, uh, you, want to be, you want people to quickly be able to get your three references. You want to prep your references. You want to sit down with each and every one of them, show them your resume, explain to them exactly what it is you do. Uh, now, of course, when you first graduate, you're probably not going to have professional references. You're probably going to have people who you've worked with, people who are not exactly in the industry. That's fine. Prepare them. Prepare them to give a good reference. And for gosh sakes, do not let them reveal that they're a family member or they were a relative of yours that takes away the strength of the reference. So work with them, role play with them so they give you a reference. And of course, after the interview, if you're excited about the job and you think they're making you an offer, call all of your references and explain to them, hey, I just interviewed at EA and I think they're gonna make a job offer. You know what? I really didn't stress A, B, and C. Would you do that in my reference? And also, I think they're kind of curious about E, D, and F. So would you make sure that that's mentioned as well? So that's what I'm talking about, preparing your references to give you a good reference. OK, moving on. So you know, you know, your job hunting is similar to selling and marketing and anything. Consider yourself a product, just like Procter & Gamble considers their soap, uh, just like Procter & Gamble considers their Pringles, just like they do their toothpaste and their scope. You are a product. Create a brand around yourself and use that brand and be consistent about it. It's very important. You spend a lot of time learning those basic skills to get into the industry. You're investing a lot of time and money to do that. You need to invest time and money in your demo and, of course, in your brand. It's very important to do that. Okay, your resume. Uh, uh, people do not read resume. Whoa, we're a little bit ahead. People don't read resumes anymore. Computers do. So it's really important that you design the resume for easy scannability. You want it to easily be re read on the computer screen by the hiring manager, and you certainly want the computer system to be able to read it and parse the information off your resume so the proper file and human resources created about you. If you have made a mistake and do, and do a horrible job on that resume, this is not going to be a good file. And EA is not going to pick up the phone when they're getting 7,000 resumes a month and say, hey, Tom, your resume didn't parse. Not going to happen. So you, it's really your responsibility to make sure that resume is in proper format so that it is uh, easily digestible. Resume should communicate skills, not accomplishments. The purpose is to get you an interview, not to show your art skills, not to do anything else but to get you an interview. So that's the focus of the resume. And of course, you want to use all the buzzwords you could possibly think of in our industry, uh, because buzzwords are what we're looking for in the resume when the resume comes in, uh, and that's what people attach to. You want to present your skills in a way that captures the attention of a reader. Forget the one-page rule. That's old information from business school, creative types. We're more than used to having two, a three-page resume. Most resumes are about two pages long, but we are creative folks, so do not be shy. About, uh, about a resume that's laid out correctly. Pay attention to your layout. Don't cram too much on one page. If I see a one-page resume that's in eight font, I don't want to read that. Do you? I don't, I'm emotionally already turned off to the document. If it is a mess 
on, on, you know, on the screen or if it's mess in print. So lay it out correctly, take some time. Your artist's in here, you should understand 2D layout as well as 3D layout. Make it a comfortable, approach, emotionally approachable document so people want to read it. Uh, make sure your name, your email address, your website, your telephone number is on every page, on every image, or every asset you create so that people can get a hold of you when they're ready to, to, to approach you. No fancy schmancy in the resume. Be very careful about what you highlight and what you bullet within your resume. You're selling yourself. You're not selling the college you went to. You're not selling the title education. You're not selling the section heading work experience. You are selling your name. That's what gets bolded. You are selling the title you held at the company, not the company. You are selling the game title you created. You are selling the, de the degree, bachelor's of animation, bachelor's of computer science, not Westwood College, not Carnegie Mellon. That you are selling you. So that's what you need to focus on in the resume. Keep in mind, the eye jumps to what is bolded. Don't overdo it. Here's an example of a resume with art. Now, I don't know about you, my eye goes immediately to the art, my, my, my eye goes immediately to the objective statement and to, this, and to whatever, that, that, whatever that is, the abilities over there. That's not what you're selling. And plus, now there's just a litany of words. I don't want to look at this. I don't even want to read this. In fact, I didn't read the resume. And, and the person who wrote this resume, it took them almost a year to get a job because I, until, I have, until I actually reformatted the resume for them because I was so sick at looking at it. So this is not where your art goes. Your art goes on your demo. The resume is just to get you an interview. So let's talk about file format, very important. Uh, PDF files are death. Did you hear that? PDF files are death to your job search. They are a vector graphic image. Vector images are not readable by a computer. Computer makes mistakes. You want a document file, a text file. You must make sure your database file that is created for about you at the game company is correct and complete, not something that's incorrect. And a PDF file will certainly create a mess of a database file for you. The, company, the game company won't even know you approach them. So please, do yourself a favor. Forget the PDF. Forget columns. Forget the fancy fonts. Forget all of that stuff. Straightforward, boring, boring, you know, Serafina type font, you know, resume. Times Roman numeral, Arial. I know it's a bore, but the resume is only purpose is to communicate your accomplishments so that someone's interested to get on the phone and interview you. Um, great. So I think we've kind of covered that. Uh, again, sell your accomplishments. Forget an objective statement. No one cares what you want. People want to know what you can do for them. Don't write a job description. Explain what you learned as a result of your experience. So as you can see from this example, design and develop Tank 3, a 3D first third person game for Xbox responsible for the, the AI, and I learned the following. And you know, and just kind of list that out so people get that you actually walked away from the experience learning something, because that's what we're looking for. Beginning of the resume, put your name. Right under your name, what is it you want to be? Well, I'm a game industry recruiter or career coach. That kind of focuses you there, right, right there. And then, of course, right under your name, benefit, 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 benefit. What do you bring to the game company? Most people are only going to read your name and the first part of your resume, and the rest of it they're not going to read unless you've captured their attention in that first section. Then they'll slow down and read the resume. Otherwise, garbage can, because there's a thousand other resumes on their desk they are not going to spend the time. So figure out what bullet and benefit items that you bring to the table. What genres have you, uh, uh, do you know? What platforms have you done? What coding ability? What art ability? What art software do you know? These are the things we want to know, and that's all we want to know. OK, so again, we talked about bolding. Bold your degree at XY University, XYZ University. Bold the degree down here. And you know, there's over 300 colleges now teaching school, uh, teaching game programs. So there's something really cool or unusual about uh, the Westwood program or the program you're in then you need to tell the reader about that because they're not going to know. So tell them that in the, in, the, in the thing. Okay, ending your resume. Miscellaneous data. You want to avoid it. 
Don't give anyone a reason to reject you. Forget about your marital status. Forget about your religion. Forget about your sexual orientation or any of your hobbies unless they relate to a video game. So if you're an airplane pilot, sure, put that down. That relates to flight sim games. If you were a semi-pro sports figure, great, put that down. That relates to sports games. Otherwise, kill it. Do not put it on the resume. Not of interest to anybody and will only serve to get you rejected. Your demo. It must capture attention immediately and amaze the viewer. You're not creating a movie. It should be, you need to think ahead about the impression you're trying to make, and here's where your consistent brand is shown. Show your best stuff and end it there. We really don't care to see anything else but your best work. Credit everything you use. So that means if you've taken a wireframe from somebody else, you found it on the internet, and you use that wireframe and built your asset on top of that, you better give credit to that wireframe. Believe me, if you found it, the art director knows about it, the lead artist knows about it, we all know about it. Give credit where credit is due, or that is a reason for you not to get a job. Uh, keep copies of everything you do now in school and when you're at work. Now, of course, you're going to sign a non-disclosure agreement uh, and a non you know, uh, you know, at the company you join. But a non-disclosure agreement is about not giving away the game's concept and idea. One or two or three art images out of context of a game is not going to tell anyone what the game is or what the gameplay is. You're not violating your NDA. What you are doing is keeping copies of your work so that you have work to show. Because of course, if you get laid off from the game company, the minute you walk in the door, your computer's turned off. Everything's done. Your desk has been cleaned. They, they don't give you a chance to go back to your desk. So always keep copies of your work, keep them organized, keep them filed, so that you can pull out that art when you're customizing your demo. Uh, it's OK. Uh, you know, Online demos are a must. No CDs, no zip drives, not acceptable. Uh, you're uh, certainly welcome to use a smart smartphone, a tablet, or any kind of handheld device during the face-to-face -face interview. But do not expect someone to download it to their handheld device. Not going to happen. OK. You are judged on your demo by what you can execute. That is what the demo is all about. So keep it simple and easy to navigate. Show your best work and leave it at that. Don't create fan art. Create original art. What do I mean by fan art? OK, you want to work at LucasArts. You want to work on Star Wars. It's your fantasy. You love the, you love the movie. You got to work on the game. Do not create Darth Vader. Do not show another Luke Skywalker. That is fan art. That is not original art. You are being evaluated on what you can create and what you can do. Create images that would work in a Star Wars game, but do not create art that's already been created by somebody else. Customize your art assets toward the target companies that you are approaching. We've mentioned that before. Label each of your assets. This is two, what 2D, what 3D software did you use, and how many polys were used in the image. We're evaluating what you can accomplish. And if you can accomplish something in 10 pixels that takes someone 100 pixels, wow, I'm interested. So definitely you want people to know what you did. Never force downloads to view any assets. And of course, create a brand for yourself, just like your Procter & Gamble. So demo suggestions. OK, game designers, make mods and levels. Create design documents. Artists, show your best stuff, stuff for of, uh, and keep, the, keep it simple, show your best stuff only. Programmers, make game creation tools. Show finished work. Make complete games. Show code samples. And make sure those code samples are very clean and well documented. OK, pointers for specific specialties. Modelers, no moving videos. We're not interested in the video. Show still images from different views. That's what we're looking for when we're looking at models. Uh, concept artists, you want to show strong shape and design. You want to show color and theory. And you want to show that you have the ability to render. That's all we're looking at. So that's what you want to do. Animators, focus on the high quality moments of your animation. Don't show me the entire animation. Not interested. Focus in on what the high quality moment is in the animation and show that. We're looking for push and pull. We're looking for weight. We're looking for fluidity. We are not looking to watch a movie. Visual effects. Show, your, show high quality in-game effects. 
learn those particle systems for the Unity engine, the Unreal engine, or any engine that your target company is using. Um, and of course, uh, you want to definitely show that effect. Uh, so make a little, uh, little movie, like a, make a little mini uh, video of the effect uh, so that people can see it, uh, you know, of course. And then there's the tech artist. You want to l show people your code as well as show the effect again in a video as it's moving. Okay, references, we kind of uh, went over that, so let's just go to beating the odds. You really want to find a way to stand out. We've talked about networking, attending conferences, going to exhibitions, joining organizations, IGDA, gang, if you're an audio person, read books, there's plenty of resources for that. You know, find ways to stand out. You want to blog. Uh, there's WordPress, TypePad, Windows Live Spaces. Uh, you know, tackle subjects, write articles. Have that as part of your demo. If you are talking and writing about the industry, we're going to be interested in you. Uh, Self-promote, website, newsletter, press release, share links, do mailers. You know, come up with clever ways to be, to be seen. You know, when I, if I was you and I'm an artist and approaching an art company, I'd start sending an image to the art director. Send an image. And then four days later, send another image. Then a few days later, send your resume. You know what I mean? It's about getting interest in you. You know, so you know, think about it. Think outside the box. Don't just throw a resume at someone and think that's going to work. Okay, so we've talked about attending events, maintaining an online presence, become an active part of the community, whatever your community is. There's art communities all over the place. Use the internet. Use video sharing sites, news groups, trade publications. Uh, create compelling content. Find ways to stand out. There are indie projects. There are mods. There's videos. There's art groups to join. There's, do a podcast. It's $10 to buy a microphone. Buy a microphone. Do a podcast. Get involved with community forums, IGDA, Game Career Guide, GameDev.net. Uh, and of course, modding. You definitely want to mod, uh, especially your favorite games. Hey, you want to go work for ZeniMax or Bethesda Softworks? You better believe if you do a mod of Fallout, they'll hire you before you can blink an eye. But if you've never modded any of their games, what's the motivation? Why are they going to hire you over somebody else? So get clever. That's why I'm telling you to make a target company list so that you can focus yourself on those lists. There are other engines, of course, besides Unity Unreal, and I encourage you to learn as many as possible. And some of them are quite cheap. There's the Torque engine, XNA, iPhone SDK, Android. Learn Xbox Live, PlayStation Network. Learn, learn, learn. The more skills you can list on your resume, the more engines you can list on your resume, the more interested the hiring manager is going to be in talking to you. OK, let's look at some free educational resources. Today we're going to have Design 3. They have an awesome program that will help augment what you're learning here at Westwood College. And the Design 3 folks will be coming up to uh, tell you a little bit more about that program. But they've got thousands of videos on there to teach you, to train you, to expose you. They even have a game contest going on where they're developing a game. Get involved. Other places are Game Career Guide, Online Education Database, you know, Game Audio Network. Take advantage of what's out there and use the resources. Um, so jumpstart your career. There's GameDev.net, GameMasters.net, UltimateGameProgramming.com. You know, books, C++, new research and development. Augment what you're learning at school with other stuff. It's work. I know it's work, but it's work to get your fantasy job. You think any actor, everyone wants to be an actor. So only a few people get to be an actor. Guess what? Only a few people get to be an animator, get to be a kick-ass game designer, get to be, you know, in our industry. So why aren't that, in, why isn't that you? Make it happen. Okay. Make projects on off hours. Do prototypes. Do technology demos. Do clever hacks to popular games. Extend a game. Do a Pong clone. Add a new feature. Let people know about the feature. I've told you to create a network, didn't I? So use that network. You already have introduced yourself to a few artists that work at EA, for example. If you've created a new asset here at school, send them a link to the new asset. They don't have to respond to you. You're not looking for a response. Just keep sending them emails. You know, hey, I did this at Westwood. And, hey, now I'm doing that. What do you think? You know, keep showing them your work. People hire who they know, not who they don't know. 
And even if they're not responding to your emails, as long as you're not hassling them and hounding them, they will remember you. And when that job in the meeting comes open, hey, guys, i got to hire a junior artist. Anyone of you know anybody? Because, of course, the art director is going to ask internally first. You're going to be the one that comes to mind. Hey, what about that guy, Jake? What about that lady, Amy, who kept call keeps calling me? Let's go, let, me go, let me go find their information, and then, and then they'll contact you. It may be the first time they respond to you. That's okay. But at least you're known. You keep, you keep showing up, showing up, showing up. Okay, jumpstart your career. Gek Engine. Get it. Learn it, especially if you're interested in Fallout 3 and you want to go work for ZeniMax, ID, or Bethesda Softworks, or any of the companies that they own. Hammer Engine. That's great for um, Half-Life and Counter-Strike. Aurora Engine. That's great for uh, Bioware and uh, modding some of their stuff. Uh, Unreal uh, UDK, you know, learn it. It's great for that. That's how you can get to work for, uh, for, the, for that company as well as work for many companies, actually. So it's really about applying what you learn. Other websites, Brenda has a great site, Brenda Brightwhite. So get to Brenda's site. There's multiplayerblog.mtv.com. There's Game Set Watch, Brainer Game, Game Dev Blog. Gamma Sutra, Game Industry Biz will help you know what's going on. Specialty resources. I'm actually going faster than you now, huh? Uh, specialty resources. Just think you skipped one, but that's okay. Okay, GameDev.net, FlipCode.com, LevelDesigner.com. There's just so much resources out there. Use them. Use them to your advantage. Online resources for artists, CG Society and CG Talk, really the most important places for you to hang and to get involved. There's also 3D Total, Polycount, Zebra Central, Dominance Wars. I encourage each and every one of you to not only get on that website, but participate in the Dominance Wars contest. Are you kidding me? Put that on your resume. Awesome. ConceptArtPlay.com. Uh, of course, Design 3, as I mentioned before, has uh, thousands of videos on there. They're a great resource for you to use to augment what you're learning here at Westwood. And I'll let the Design 3 folks come up to tell you a little bit more about themselves um, when, right after my presentation. Specialty resources. There's meetup groups in every city, LinkedIn, Facebook groups, Photoshop groups, digital artist groups of all flavors and types. Get involved. Get noticed. On your resume, too, it's very important to list it. So that's basically my presentation in a nutshell. I uh, definitely want to leave the floor open for questions. I hope I didn't uh, talk too fast and blaze through this too quickly. But I uh, did want to make sure that I gave you at least some general understanding of what it is you need to do to get a job in the industry.